Hey, you want a bunch of tips on drawing Fakemon? Hey all you nerds, Gabe, aka Fruppy Art here, and if you clicked on this video, you are ready to draw some Fakemon of your very own. Now this is the last video in a three-part series, and if you haven't watched the previous two, you need to go back and watch them. Alright, this is primarily about techniques used when rendering, so if you don't have a solid concept and design to work from, there's not much of a point being here yet. So go back and watch them if you haven't, links down below, and then you can come back here. All right, we're ready? Okay, let's start this lesson. The official Pokemon art style. Odds are you are interested in having your Fakemon look as close to the official Pokemon artwork as possible. My style that I've been using for my Pokemon Amber series isn't perfect, but it matches pretty well. So I'll be showing you the tips and tricks that I use to achieve it. That being said, I don't actually think that it is imperative that your artwork matches the Pokemon style exactly. Heck, even Game Freak isn't consistent over the years. It is far more important that your artwork is intentional. Digital art. Now I draw my art digitally nowadays. I specifically use Photoshop, but if you use a different drawing program, many of the tools and techniques that I will be using are likely available in your program, though maybe under a different name. Also, if you don't have the ability to draw digitally or you prefer working in a physical medium, a lot of what I'm gonna be going over will still pertain to you. So to start off, I'm gonna boot up the software and open my project. I'll show you two important things right off the bat. One, my canvas is huge. Don't waste your time trying to create a piece of art whose resolution is gonna be tiny in the end. Go big or go home. I like to draw on a 4K canvas since I released my final videos in 4K, but if you can't work at 4K, you should still try and get your canvas as big as possible. The 300 resolution that I'm using here is definitely overkill, uh, but it isn't a bad idea if you think you may want a print version of what you're doing eventually. And secondly, looking on the right side of the screen, I have my Photoshop file organized. Each design has its own folder with labeled layers. So stay organized, my friends. It will help you so much in the long run. Okay, let's start in. Line work. So we are continuing from where we left off in the last episode. That means that you already have an awesome developed concept and a great design sketched out. I'll be showcasing everything from here on out with the extinct giant platypus designs from the Paleon region. So the design is looking good. You know, sometimes this sketch may be rougher or it may be very close to the final line art. Whatever it is, if you have access to layers in your program, make sure that this is on its own layer. We're gonna call it sketch. Always name your layers, kids. It helps keep things organized and minimizes the chance that you'll accidentally art all over the wrong layer. So you can now drop down the opacity of your sketch layer. This will give you the shadow of your design to almost trace with a new layer. And we'll call that new layer lines. Now, there are two ways you can go about creating your lines here. The first is to create vector lines. These aren't available in all programs, but I'll still go over them. These are simple shapes or lines determined by set points. The advantage of using vector lines is that you are going to get some beautifully smooth curves. You will never be able to match by hand what vector lines can do. But there is a trade-off. They can often look a bit too mechanical, and you'll also lose the line width variability when you go this route and you may need to go in by hand and erase and thin some of the sections out. Now, you normally can't edit vector lines like that, so you'll need to take the vector layer and rasterize it. This basically turns it into a regular layer, and now you can erase and modify. If this sounds like a pain, that's because it is, all right? But it may be necessary if you need that perfect circle or very precise curve. And that's what I do. I add select vector lines to my renderings only when needed. So the second type of line and what I primarily use is just a simple brush. 
Now the brush that I use in Photoshop is a custom brush that I built in the program. So your options may vary depending on your software, but I recommend finding a nice thin brush with just a bit of texture to it. Oh, and ideally you can use a pressure sensitive stylus so that there is some line width variability. And though it makes drawing a bit more difficult, you really will want that brush to be thin. If you look in the upper right of my canvas, you can see that I even doodled myself a reminder of my brush size for my line art. So once you have a brush that you are happy with, you can start doing the line work. But as always, there are some pros and cons. First off, it is gonna look hand-drawn, which is great. You know, the official Pokemon art style, while drawn digitally, is supposed to feel hand-drawn but it's gonna be really difficult to draw, again, those perfect circles and curves. You can either get ready to try and undo, try and undo, try and undo until you get a curve you like, or you know, be ready to fall back on the vector lines when you need to. The final product, you know, it should look hand-drawn, but not sloppy or sketchy. So just be sure to follow through with your lines, you know, be intentional. And honestly, just practice. I know that stinks to hear, but you just need to practice a lot. Your success with hand-drawn lines is gonna come from two main places. Firstly, your experience. And secondly, ugh, and this also sucks to hear, but the size of your drawing tablet plays a huge role. I'm fortunate enough to have a decently sized Wacom drawing tablet. And that size allows me to use my arm more when drawing arcs and lines. If you have a smaller screen, it will just be a little tougher to create long, smooth strokes. So put in the practice and find what combination of vector and hand-drawn lines will lead to the best final product. Ooh, uh, an extra tip real fast for doing line work. Uh, let's say that I was drawing our little platypus boy and I have drawn the tail, but I need to add the nose and the little feet, but they overlap. Now, I don't wanna draw super carefully and have to erase things very precisely. So what I can do is create an additional layer to draw on. Now I can hop between those layers and erasing things isn't nearly as precise and then combine them when I'm done. But let's speed things up and finish the line work for these two designs. All right, looking pretty good, looking pretty good. Uh, what's next? Color. I'm gonna show you a trick that has ended up saving me so much time when it comes to coloring line work. Instead of creating a new blank layer, you are going to duplicate your line art and just drag it so that it is under your primary line layer. And we're gonna rename it Color. And just from there, I can take the paint bucket tool and start dropping in colors. Neat, that's super cool. But this still isn't an optimal workflow because what if I wanted to add some extra color detail by hand? Uh, let me grab a brush. And let's see, if I wanted to color just the top half of the little stitch coming off of his head, it's difficult and like there, whoops, you know, I accidentally went outside of the lines and that's just a pain. So instead, we're gonna go back before we dropped in any color and we're gonna take the magic wand selection tool or whatever your program's equivalent may be and select everything outside of the design. And just follow me on this one. We're gonna select, modify, expand, and then expand the selection by just two pixels. And now we can see that the selection area is landed right in the middle of the perimeter line. But as you can see, I'm now only able to draw outside of the Pokemon shape. So we'll just need to invert the selection. And now we have selected only the area inside of the line art. Now I can fill things with color and do detail coloring without having to worry about accidentally going outside of the lines. The selection, you know, it just, it just won't let you. So it's super, super helpful. In fact, we will leave this selection area active all the way through doing the shadows and highlights as well. Just, you know, so we don't have to worry about going outside the lines and making shadows out there. But it's very, very helpful. Do this, it saves so much time. And with that, we can pretty easily just fill in our design. I usually haven't completely decided on my colors at this point, so I spend some time swapping things around and seeing what looks best. 
And once I'm happy with the look of it, it's time to move on to shadows and highlights. Now it is at this point that I go ahead and create all of my shadow and highlight layers. And of course, label them. They should live in between your color layer and your line layer and set them to 50% so that they aren't too punchy. Now, a feature that a lot of digital art programs offer and we will be utilizing big time are blend types for layers. And they let me choose how this layer will react with the layers below it. I won't go into all of them now, just know that they are a very powerful tool. I'm gonna set my shadow layer to multiply, which helps darken things while maintaining some color. And I'm gonna set my highlights to overlay, which basically does the same thing, but opposite. Now you may assume that shadows and highlights should just be black and white, but that actually isn't gonna look the best. Instead, I prefer to have my shadows be a dark purple and my highlights be like a, a warm yellow. Again, you can see that I left myself reminders for these at the top of the canvas. That way, when I get to this point, I can always just nab those colors and use them. Now, it doesn't matter nearly as much what brush you use to lay down your shadows and highlights. You know, I like something larger with a good amount of texture to it. Now, it's gonna take some practice, but you wanna make sure that you understand the three dimensionality of your design before you start laying in your shadows. Your goal is to further communicate the form. The viewer should understand just how it would look in three dimensions. Now, the hardest part about adding shadows and what I still struggle with is that the official Pokemon art style uses them pretty sparingly and often simplifies their contours. So even though I struggle, less is more with shadows. The same goes with highlights, but we're gonna be leaving a pretty harsh edge on these for now and taking care of them in the next step. Blending and texture. I have another custom brush that I use and this time it is a blender. We're gonna come back up here and see 10. Yep, that's a reminder of the size that I use. This smushes and blurs the shadows and highlight layers around with a bit of a kind of watercolor looking texture to it. So I can hop to my shadow and highlight layers and blend those edges. Again, I'm not the best at this, but the transitions for shadows in particular tend to be quite abrupt. So as much as you wanna blend it far out and make it smooth and artistic, that's just not what the Pokemon renders usually do. I have the tendency to overblend, but they again, they should be nice and quick, soft edges. The highlights are a little bit more forgiving. Um, oh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that the highlights and shadows are both great places to add in a touch of texture. Depending on the directionality of the blending, you can add more characteristics to the skin or fur or flames or whatever else your design may have. Like as you see here, by dragging out the shadow like this, it almost looks like a kind of stitched fabric thing. Very cute, very appropriate. All right, uh, let me finish up all the shadow real fast. Blendy, blendy, blendy. Uh, and once all of that is looking great, and it is, uh, let's do the last step. Shiny colors. Head down and duplicate your color layer. I'm going to call it shiny. Now I can just grab my paint bucket tool and start playing around until I land on a shiny that is awesome. For these little goobers in particular, since they are based on Frankenstein's monster and the original 1931 film was obviously in black and white, we're gonna have a fun little grayscale shiny. Pretty neat. And that's it. I hope that you use these tips and tricks with your own art. If you are an aspiring artist, you'll have to let me know how your Fakemon journey is going. And be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you found this series helpful. All right, later nerds.